All right. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, episode of Breaking Absolutes. Um, this may be the um, most fun I'm, I've ever had on this show or I'm ever going to have. Um, I get to talk about a record that is uh, continues to be and, and started my musical life, but so foundational, uh, not just for me, but for so many other, others. And I've got some um, fun things to talk about. With me, I've got John Petrucci from the band, who's been gracious enough to give me a little time to... to um, wax nostalgic, uh, but then talk about how that really began a journey that brings them right up to some of, I think, the best music that they've ever made with a view from the top of the world. Um, let me just set, set up a little bit for folks who um, may know Dream Theater, uh, but maybe remember them mostly for their early stuff um, and uh, kind of set up the conversation as I frame it with a band that's had a 30-year career, 30-plus year career, um, that seen them um, bookended by um, charting on Billboard and then just recently winning a Grammy. Um, this record, Images and Words, came out, um, oh, um, 92, I think it was. John, John will keep me honest on it. Um, but it's, it hit, like, uh, they had a, pre, a pre-existing record, but there were some lineup changes um, and some maturity, I think, in the songwriting that we'll talk about um, that resulted in a record that set an immensely high bar for progressive metal music um, for themselves too, of course, uh, and a bar that a lot of musicians, myself included, have forever tried to, to reach ourselves, which is good. I think that those standards like help us try and be our best selves. Um, and so we, we use this music as a, as a North Star to guide, you know, our own journeys. Um, but the record, just a few Bon Mots on it. Um, in 92, it, Billboard top uh, Heat Seekers was hit number two. Greatest out, our German album charts ninety four. It had three singles, uh, "Pull Me Under," um, still their best charting uh, uh, single at tenth. Uh, but "Take the Time" hit twenty ninth. Another day hit twenty second. Um, they hit uh, sixty one on the Billboard two hundred, which is pretty big deal. Um, they are um, in Italian charts. They hit eighty eight. In Japanese charts, they hit. So the the uh, even though they had a pre existing rec- record, <clears throat> interestingly, their sophomore record which often you've heard the sophomore slump was not that at all. In fact, quite the opposite really sort of set them off. Um, there are other chart positions, um, you know, and, and accolades. It was um, rated or certified gold in both Japan and the United States. And I think that those things are industry um, acknowledgements that are important, um, particularly back then. Um, it's still true today, but they were in a, in a time that was, um, crowded with new music that was coming in and sort of shifting trends in music. So the fact that they established all of that without being a part of the trend, I think is remarkable. So with that as my setup, let me bring John on. John, welcome. Hey, what's going on, Peter? Hey, man. Um, First thing I have to say is thank you. You've been gracious with me in the past. And again, today, give me a little time. Um, It's always a pleasure to talk to you, um, both as a friend and as a musician. Uh, So first, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I appreciate this. This is fun. I'm a big fan of yours. Obviously, you wrote the astonishing novel, and yeah. you're an awesome singer. And so, this is my pleasure as well. And by the way, not a lot of people realize I actually live in the images and words um, <laughs> room. Yeah. At this, yeah. So. Yeah, you I've are been, the you are the sleeper. <laughs> yeah, I, I built my I built my house. No. Um, <laughs> You know, the producer in me has to point something out. I don't know if you you moved your mic before or something, and there's like a underlying weird hum every time you talk all of a sudden. Oh, maybe maybe I got a bad position. I don't know what you did. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Are well you, are you still hearing it? I'm hearing it, but I don't want to hold it up. <laughs> it's not coming it's not coming through on my end. All right, so, cool. Maybe I'm just which, hearing it. Well, so that'll be unfortunate for you, but the fans are not hearing it and perfect the post the video will be okay. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so I want to, I kind of want to uh, dig in a little bit. Um, I, I talked about the chart positions. It's really interesting to me, John, this, this journey that you've had, and we can't possibly cover it all, but I think the bookends make a nice way to, to frame the conversation because while there was a first record, and I don't want to dismiss that, there was this sort of moment in time with uh, images and words that set the band on a trajectory um, with all the, all the chart positions and industry acknowledgement. And then just recently, I think I just in the past few days, I saw your your Instagram pic sh- holding the Grammy, right? 
Um, and that is yet another like pinnacle of sort of industry acknowledgement. And I know it's not all about that um, because if nothing, Dream Theater has been a, fa a fan-based um, band. Uh, you, you're, you're, I, I think I've told you before, I think once you guys win a fan, they're fans for life. They don't come in and out. Right, right. Um, but you, but you, what it suggests to me is, and I think all of the people that are Dream Theater fans would agree, is there's this consistency of striving for excellence. And I know that you and I both know that um, reactions to records are subjective. But over time, I think that this is a nod to the fact that the band, which is still a working writing band, is, is um, still firing on all its pistons. Do you right. have any reaction to that idea? I mean, is that part of how you feel about how you want to conduct your career? Well, I do. That's a great way of putting it. You know, I, I still, I, and this is something that's common with all the Dream Theater members. We still love doing what we do. Uh, you know, even even though Images and Words came out July 7th, 92, so 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, even though it's it's even longer than that since we've been a band um, and there have been a couple of member changers, changes, all of the members have this sort of attitude where we we love doing what we do. We love being creative people we still love practicing and playing our instruments and when we get together the, to write our headspace is always like we just want to write the best thing we possibly can and never rest on our laurels or get lazy about it always go the extra mile i know i feel that way as a producer i'm always trying to figure out ways to make the band sound better and get the right people involved in the records and and so i think that's why we've had a consistent career somebody asked me the other day how we're able to sort of do that for a long period of time. And I think it's always, you know, raising the bar and trying to like keep the level as high as we can um, at, at all times, yeah. e even, even as we present our live shows and the kind of touring we, we do, that's been a huge part of our career uh, and a mainstay is, is our connection with our fans, as you mentioned, and the amount of touring all around the world that we do and that we've done for so many years now. Um, so all those things. Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned it before the Grammy thing, it's, it, it's such a great nod because it's like, you don't see progressive bands or progressive metal bands win things like that. And so it kind of signifies the, that uh, part of the industry and community recognizing um what we're doing in this type of music and i think it's a great uh it's a great nod to like just prog in general so it's 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 an honor to to have had that um and these moments in our career they are these milestone moments that you remember and you kind of think back on and and how they they help propel your career forward but the idea of constantly striving to be your best and, and really truly enjoying what you do is is at the bottom of it i think that that comes through pretty clearly in music um it, even though uh, different records have uh, a different personality it's all yeah. ultimately dream theater um this is the this is my my little soapbox on fandom is i think when you become enamored of a band at least for me you become really enamored of wanting to go on the journey with them and that means the different um the different type of records they want to write the different headspace they're in when they're writing sure. those records yeah uh and you guys have always whatever those uh, you know existing conditions around you have been the records have always just been sort of top door um and i think this is why you've garnered this fan base that persists over time it's not a uh, you're not um you know for better or worse you don't trend very often you know so right. you're not on tiktok trending you know you it's a uh, I, I hate to say it but a, a girl in her bathroom on her back singing some lip sync thing and it gets a gajillion views and then warner signs them and they blow up um and then next week it, they don't have a career anymore um yeah you you guys are are like musicians that are that care about the craft and over time have continued to put in that effort and like fans know that um and so it's in the thing that's remarkable, John, is that um, this all arrived, even though the very first record, I think, is sometimes underrated and really good. But it, you guys landed with this particular album. It was all there. I was re-listening to Images and Words. And then I was doing this thing where I, so I was side by side listening to A View from the Top of the World. And while there's clearly differences and there's the band's grown and stuff, 
what's pr- there's there's a presence in that very first record that continues and I, i've got some comparisons I'll, I'll share in a minute but it's it's remarkable to me that the maturity of songwriting and playing existed that far back is there like how how shall i account for that as a layman <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, we, you know, it, it's funny. I'm glad that you, you, you've noticed that and appreciate that. I think we, we sort of developed our sound, fortunately, pretty early, pretty, pretty early on. Um, and as much as the first record came out and really, you know, that was the first thing we ever did, our int- uh, people's introduction to the band. And you can hear on the first record, what type of band we were we were obviously you know a a metal band that was playing progressive music you know with these long songs and and the different kind of arrangements and stuff like that you know the 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 style of the band was definitely established but images established the the sound yeah um obviously it's when james came in so it established the you know the the vocal aesthetic of the band sure um and it it, it kind of just for some reason everything just came into focus on that record. I don't know if it was because we had done the first one, and then there was a whole period of time where we were auditioning singers, and we didn't have a record label, and we weren't sure what was going to happen, and we were working on this music. Um, I don't know if it had to do with that, that, or just the experience in the studio with David Prater and uh and Derek Oliver having signed us and that type of you know elation just to be back in that position where we can do this again but something everything sort of came together uh to where um as much as the first record was an introduction images was like it it established what we were going to be moving forward and like you said when you listen to a view you can still hear that same kind of spirit and that you know that that basic sound that that we established then is still alive and well you know yeah um even though the band has evolved and changed and production techniques and things have changed um you still the identity of the band is very much cemented in images and followed through on uh, every record after that yeah it really has and that i i, I think that even includes um the lyrical approaches and i know sure. that you guys have taken all kinds of themes and um, fictional narrative ideas over the years. But I like, as I was looking at these two records, they, they both concerned themselves um, in large part with the ideas of life and right. challenges of life. And ultimately the hope of, of reaching past those challenges to something. And those are, um, those are not to be too high minded about it, but those are really important things to write music about. Um, and the band is, has, no, you know, it's not, I don't mean to suggest um, an over seriousness uh, because it's not that. It usually feels just has this um, injection of, of hopefulness in the way that you represent these ideas. But the band's done that here and there all across the years. Is Do you think consciously about that or is it, you think it's just a way you, is it an organic way that you approach when you write? Because I think, I think, I think I've told you this before, you know, all the lyrics are good, but you have a particularly incisive lyrical pen in my mind i think it's uh you do a wonderful job of expressing these ideas um and so i i'm interested in in whether it's something that's just really really organic for you or if you really think about it before you start getting the words down right well thank you for saying that i appreciate it i mean part of it for me as a lyricist is as i really focus in on besides the meaning of whatever i'm writing on uh, the sounds of words and how they are conveyed by a singer. I, th- that to me is just fascinating. And it, it's there, there's like a craft and an art to that, that when you get it right, it just like, it's so satisfying. Um, so a lot of like the focus of my lyric writing has to do with, with crafting the words and sounds and rhymes and little clever things that goes in, into it as much as, whatever the topic I'm writing about. Yeah. Um, as far as it being organic, you know, I, I suppose it is. I, I think that, you know, I, I, for lyricists, a lot of your personality comes out. So um, the things that you are passionate about or into or whatever happened to you in your life or whatever fictional story 
you're coming up with uh, all has to do with your own experience. So in that sense, it is organic. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is a very conscious effort, at least on my part, to to convey certain types of messages. Uh, e even if I write about something that's controversial, um, I, I try not to get too dark. I guess that's something. Yeah that that I, I i do with my my lyrics i try to have a sense of hopefulness you mentioned it before yeah. um i i like there whether it's a fictional story or a real life story i like there to be some sort of arc to the to the lyric in the song um and that's all conscious for sure and that's all the craft and uh i also try not to get too preachy uh yeah. that, that's another thing there's certain things that are turnoffs for me like lyrics that are preachy or too self-important or political or things like that you know i kind of like to to me you know music and and art and movies and stuff like that as much as it's their opportunities and their their ways to make you feel things deeper they're also escapes you know and exactly. so like i i like that kind of when going into a song and a lyric even if it's a deeply personal uh um topic there's something about it there, there needs to be some hope uh and some positivity um yeah. you know for me at least you know i think that's that's important i think that's evident in yeah. in the lyrics that you write um no it's interesting knowing the more i get to know about you the more i feel like i i um see some subtext in some of the things that you write yeah. and that's I think that's a that's a viable and, and interesting fan response is when and I'm not the only one. Um, and it's also what you said there's true is your your lyric writing usually turns turns hopeful, even if even if there's areas where you're, you're exploring the darkness. It's yeah, uh, always with this idea of getting to some place that's hopeful. There is. I mean, even with, you know, if you think about images, since we're talking about that, you know, for me you have some some two very different lyrical uh, approaches, you know, one being another day, which was a very personal topic um, about the Ill illness my father was going through. And even about, even within that, I was trying to like have, you know, convey some hope, even though it was a very difficult time for, for me, for my dad, for my family. And then you have something like Metropolis where it's totally fictional, and that's a whole different headspace where I'm just writing about something that didn't really happen. And you're just kind of using that creative part of your brain to, to tell a story. Um, and that's a, a bit more detached emotionally. And it's, you know, it's just two, two different styles. And I, I tend to kind of go back and forth between those um, even still to this day. And, and, but on images, you can hear the, the, the difference in the, the lyrical feel between those two songs. I think it's really, really evident. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I want to dig, I want to dig just a little deeper on a few of the songs, but before yeah. we get there, just a couple quick things about um, the record. It, it is it true? I think, and I saw this all over as I was kind of just preparing for our conversation. Uh, originally change of seasons was going to be part of this record. That is correct. Yeah. So that was a song that we had done and demoed and was supposed to be part of the record. In fact, we didn't learn that it was, was not going to be part of it until we were actually in the studio at Bear Tracks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, it was, it was a phone call from Derek Oliver and it's like, yeah, I don't want to put, you know, he was the A&R head of A&R who signed us. Yeah. Um, and he's like, I, I don't want to put that on the album. It's going to take it over an hour. He wanted to keep the record to an hour and that, you know, it would have to be a, a double CD, I guess, or whatever. Anyway, for whatever yeah. reasons, he, he wanted to leave that off and promised we'd do it as an EP later, which we did. Um, we I remember being really pissed and upset at the time, um, but retrospectively, it was definitely the right decision. And, you know, Im yeah. the images and the track listing and the flow and the length is perfect. So, yeah, that he was right in thinking that. Yeah, and, and the other, and I agree with that. Um, but then I yeah. learned that Pull Me Under was like more of a last minute addition. Is that true? Um. It's a good question. It's hard. It's hard to remember. 30, 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to get this the the get it wrong. This wrong. It could it could have been the last song we wrote. That that is possible that it was the final song that we wrote. So it was later. Well, what um, I what I read, yeah. and you can yeah. either correct the record or maybe, it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really matter, I guess. But 
um, said that Pull Me Under was a last minute edition replacing um, uh, Don't Look Past Me. Hmm. That might be true. <laughs> <laughs> might be true. Well, we'll let the internet continue to believe that. We, um, we, we won't uh, put a stamp of approval on it. The funny thing is like some things I remember so vividly and some things I'm like, wait, we did that? Really? <laughs> you know, but I mean, something about that sounds pretty correct. Um, well, the reason I thought yeah. it would be interesting if it were true is I right. mean, that is the song that kind of blew up for you guys. Sure, sure. And there was something really special about it. I, I, I remember too, when the, the album was done and I had the mixes, whatever, and I, you know, would, would play that for friends or family. I was just so proud when the guitar came in. It's like, oh my God, you got to hear this, listen to this. Um, and so it was such a great choice for an opener. And we had no idea, obviously, um, that it would end up being this rock radio hit. And, you know, we, we have a gold record and everything like that. We had no idea. Nobody thought that it was like an eight minutes song whatever yeah um so yeah thank thankfully that was that was on the record um uh, yeah, but that's that... it definitely sounds familiar that it was like a later song like maybe the last one we wrote yeah yeah it was um i think you told me once that that yeah i think the band was always going to have success but though that early success of that single kind of catalyzed things right it, uh, a rock radio hit does that for a lot of bands yeah um uh, because I remember it going from zero to 60, uh, at least from our, my perception. Um, and that that song was just so much active rotation on MTV. Right, exactly. Yeah, and that's the way it works. Because, you know, that, that song started to hit. And then, like you said, MTV and everything else. It's being played on the radio. People want to know about the band. I mean, I'm stating the obvious about... <laughs> promotion and music <laughs> marketing but then you get offered bigger gigs and you're all of a sudden everybody wants you to play and that starts the band's career basically next well, thing you know you know we're booking shows in japan and europe and everywhere else well and then it's incumbent on the artist to um it's where we started is staying consistent with sure. writing and producing and you've done that um one last thing and then i want to dive in just to a couple of the tracks um, I don't know if you knew this. Oh, you probably know some of this, but there are there are a legion of uh, musicians, not just people who are still striving to gain some recognition, but those who have gained lots of recognition, who decided to do their thing because of images and words. And I learned one of these through this show. I was interviewing uh, Tomas Holopainen from Nightwish, and we were talking, and he said, "I heard that record, and that's when I decided I wanted to have a band." Oh wow, that's so cool! I, I didn't know that. That's awesome to hear. That's yes. really cool. So, in in at least one small respect, we Nightwish fans can thank you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> and they could they could thank Rush if they want to go back and. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. You, yeah. You go, keep going back. Right. Uh, um. So you you mentioned that another day was written about your your father's illness. Um. We don't need to dig into that uh, too much. Um. Mm -hmm. And I know that later you. You wrote uh, "Take Away My Pain." Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask you, though, if you can or you'll indulge me, is there's a there's a section of the lyric that is extremely poetic. Yeah. Uh, and um, I can layer on sort of what I think they mean. I, I'm interested to know if they have particular meaning to you, yeah. uh, other than just conveying emotion and it's that section from they took pictures of, of our dreams down i know you would ask that you knew it you knew it was coming <laughs> you've been asked this coming. probably before but it's this this you're always poetic but this particular um these turns of phrase excite the the mind towards some sort of nostalgia they like they really do john and so i have to know if there's something to, about those you can tell me yeah, well, it's it's funny. I, I haven't been asked about this, but sometimes I'm like nervous that people are going to ask about my more, you know, sort of uh, esoteric lyrics. And <laughs> I'm going to try, try to remember what I was trying to say. You know, that song is very personal. And it did at the time, it was cathartic to sort of write write about that subject. And, and basically that whole section um, to me, it creates a lot of imagery. We're talking images and words. So yeah. um, I was trying to sort of describe this youthful feeling uh, that, you know, when things were just more innocent before, you know, in our family, something turned, um, 
that happens to a lot of families you know if somebody gets an illness or if there's a tragedy in a family whatever uh sometimes there's there's comfort in or it's cathartic to write about what it felt like to be in this sort of safe place mm -hmm. um where that stuff wasn't happening and that's basically what that that section is trying to illustrate it's you know it's it's definitely um very abstract the way i wrote the words there um the way james sang it is brilliant it's, you know one of my my favorite sections um a, a big influence of ours as well as marillion and that's a very marillion section to me okay. um and and see that. yeah and you know i know this isn't a lyrical thing but um a, a lot of the sound of images uh, from a guitar standpoint um there was this book this chord book um called chord chemistry i've talked about it forever ted green wrote it and i was really studying this book and a lot of these sort of chordal uh combinations and things that that i learned um i i injected into the images writing and and i yeah. i remember stumbling upon that opening kind of um uh, part the opening guitar uh motif clean clean part and just liking the sort of dissonance and the the melancholy uh feeling it had and that helped to decide what to write the song about lyrically so it all ties in but anyway that book was a big influence you hear a lot of these kind of cool choral things going um but to get back to your question that's the best way i could describe that sort of weird lyrical abstract thing was my attempt to illustrate what it felt like to be you know in, in a safe place where maybe some of this other stuff wasn't actually happening like almost like an alter an altered uh timeline yeah it make, um, you know what yeah it makes sense to me how yeah. you describe it for sure right it's a very and, chi childlike sort of section and there's the um what's great about it is it, it leaves just enough that the listener can place themselves in it with their own history which is right. really really cool um yeah, yeah. There's this story about take the time uh, that that it talk it, that had something to do with talking about the stuff the band had been through, and it was mm -hmm. maybe the only song where you guys all divided up and wrote a part. Right. Do you remember the part you wrote? Um, because I think I, I, knowing your lyrics, I have a guess. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the the second verse, I believe, um, is that what you're thinking? Yes. Yeah. The second verse, which is uh, the unbroken spirit. I knew it. I knew yeah, it. yeah. You, you know just, my style. <laughs> I know your. I know your lyrical style. Yeah. I charted them all out. Who I think nice. wrote what, but and if anybody wants to, I've got my notes. It shows this is what I believe John wrote. This is a John Turner <laughs> phrase. Uh, this is a, a sorry, just a little bit of fun, but um, it's a great tune, of course. Um, uh, and I thought, I thought the idea of everybody helping express, you know, I guess this. T this time of uncertainty and change in, was a cool idea to, to have you all collaborate in that way. Well, it, it's interesting too, as I'm kind of going through the lyrics in my head, not that I'm not listening to what you're saying, no, you're that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you talked about the sort of like the hopeful nature's at nature of, of my lyrical style. And it's, it's definitely very evident in that, especially the way it ends about turning to hope, right? Right at the end <laughs> that literally uses the word. Um, it absolutely does yeah so yeah uh suppression that he feels must turn to hope it's a yeah it's a it's a my favorite part of that particular song yeah so it's seeing seeing the the light out of the darkness and you know I, I mean i explore that topic a lot illumination theory is all about that yeah man um you know and even a view from the top of the world in some ways is, is about that as well about people pushing themselves to the brink of death you know because it makes them feel more alive there's there's a lot of that uh yeah. theme theme going on absolutely um i do have to ask a little bit about metropolis so yeah. i know that it's more abstract yeah there's all kinds of internet theories about it being about romulus and remus um building rome mm. it, and and um whether that's true or not it, it's a fun thing to think about but i I'm more interested in like the, you, it feels like you've done some personification in this mm -hmm. um, thing a little bit, or at least at the very least, there's this uh, these archetypes um, uh, of death, deceit, and love being the yeah. dan dances. 
Where's uh, I love I I love the lyrical approach because I love the opportunity it provides me and all your other fans to kind of think about these things and and look at them through the filter of our own experience. Um, but I'm wondering when you began this process, did you think like I've got, I were you in like a narrative mode? Did the music like suggest to you I want to just want to write a sort of um, an, an unspecific sort of narrative experience that works with archetypes or am I, am I reading too much into it for you? Well, you're reading into too much into it a little bit. Okay. Um, you're not off base though. The music definitely dictated, I'm going to write something weird and <laughs> epic. <laughs> yeah. So you're right on that. Um, you know, honestly, uh, I, I look for a lot of times, or some, I shouldn't say I look for. Sometimes things hit me that I'm not looking for. It could be a, a, a story I read, something that happened, something that I heard that happened to somebody else or a TV show or like a news. In this case, it was it was a documentary and it was something that I was watching and it kind of impacted me. And it was all about the, the comparing these, um, these twins. I, I think the story was that they were separated and one was... Uh, received a lot of love and attention and close family. And the other one was totally neglected and what ended up happening to the two. Oh, wow. It's basically, basically what the story is about. Now, of course, I took a lot of creative license and just turned it into this whole, you know, epic adventure story um, with these dances and everything else. So it got, you know, it got a little bit weird uh, and, and more fictional yeah, for sure. But that was the that was the inspiration that was the basic in, the inspiration for that i don't think it's actually um weird like i um yeah. i really like the 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 use of the idea of um these different i guess stages or experiences of life being um seen as a dance yeah exactly I like a lot. yeah um and the reason you have the the miracle and the sleeper, it's a, it's basically you know that that everybody is kind of like born with this untapped potential, and depending on your life path or how that's nurtured, you know, uh, it, you could be a very happy and successful and prosperous person in in all ways, or you could be downtrodden and you know never yeah. really see the yeah what what the potential that you were born with, so. I thought it was a really interesting topic. Uh, again, a long time ago, you're talking 30 <laughs> plus years ago, 30 plus years ago. Um, I remember uh, watching something and just that happens to me a lot. I'll watch something or read about something here and it'll just like, I'll start thinking myself like that's such a weird thing. You know? And then you start go, going off and, and having the, your own thoughts on it and wanting to explore that. And that's what I love about the kind of music that we write and play is that it's the perfect backdrop to explore those things. You know, you don't have to fit some sort of um, topic in a three minute song. You could really go and explore it and, and yeah. get creative and have different sections and parts and characters and reoccurring themes and get all nerdy with it as much as you want. So I, I love that about, you know, prog music in general, that it allows us to, to have that, uh, that opportunity as writers. You've used that to good effect, um, certainly on this album, and I think as consistently uh, across time. Cool. And not the least of which is with the astonishing, where you oh yeah, amazing narrative work. Um, Thank you. The uh, last one, um, and then I want to transition, and I want to pull pull this forward to today with the the newest record. Yeah, but under glass moon is the other song that you treated lyrically on the album, yeah. which had, if I'm correct the interesting pr prior title of the battle of jimmy coco and fish face <laughs> right right <laughs> <laughs> a, lo a lot of times we'll name songs uh, uh we'll name songs based on what the riff sounds like somebody's trying to say <laughs> and i believe that's, <laughs> that's there, was awesome. some, there was some riff in there that sounded like somebody saying that and that, that was the title <laughs> Well, as long as we're on that topic, I, it sounds like Metropolis was at one point crumbling Metropolis. Right. Uh, and the, the only under was Oliver's Twist. Oliver's uh, Twist. Twist. You know, the interesting thing about that being Oliver's Twist. Uh, so Derek, it's obviously named after Derek Oliver, um, which would mean it probably was a later song, probably was the last song written. And the twist may have been that 
that song originally had the middle instrumental section of Erotomania in it. And maybe Derek was the one who suggested we take it out. Oh, interesting. And so it was an arrangement. So, so maybe the Oliver's twist. You know who's really great at these questions is Portnoy. He has like elephant memory. He remembers every story <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that might have been Oliver's tw twist. Was Derek Oliver's twist to take out the Erotomania section. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, that's really cool. It, it, if it wasn't that, then the twist was that we weren't going to put on uh, a change of seasons. Okay. But anyway. yeah, I love I love the fun, I love the fun of the names. We used to do yeah. the same thing. The names were we ended up keeping one. We had one called Basic Fish. Nice. We just left it. I love we played it. live Basic Fish. Um, okay, so if I but I want to do one summary thing. When I look across this record, not that this was your intent, but there definitely is a through line with images and words that has to do with, with a, a life and death um, and the triumph of life. Uh, and and attaining dreams like it's present in almost every track and and it could be that i'm looking for it but i can you know with i don't want to waste the time to do it but there's there's um not just musical movements that make you feel this way but they've been expressed lyrically and it's a uh, i think it's it's really cool that a record that was so successful did it without being so you know just inane there's mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of <clears throat> a lot of popular music um is either overly narcissistic or it's it's i just find it's kind of a name lyrically um and i know i know by the way there's some people who really don't care about the lyrics at all as long right. as the singer's on pitch and that's right. valid everybody's music experience is valid but i care about the lyrics right and so when i look and i have this experience the, the, i've listened to the album over the years of course but <clears throat> with the anniversary and because this I, I did i ever tell you when i first heard this i i loved it and i hated it uh, oh wow! I, I loved it, loved it because it's amazing. Uh, I hated it because as a fledgling vocalist, I, I was demoralized and thought I should just oh. give up. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> like, I was like, I can't make music like that. I better right. like go, you know, um, get a job. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. <laughs> uh, but but of course, I got over that very quickly. Um, but but then coming back to it and listening to it again, it's not dated. I mean, yeah, yes, people have um, debates. I think, and I know Portnoy did himself about the, the snare drum trigger. Sure. But the music and, and the lyrics, all of that survives as well today as it did then. Um, and I, it's also still salient, like because of the way you treated the, the themes, even if it was right. uh, organic um, and not sort of fully mindful, is really salient. And so with that as a lens, I started listening to A View from the Top of the World. And as I, um, we won't go through that one as much detail because I know I want to be co cognizant of your time. Yeah. And this is about images and words, but I can kind of summarize that one that there's there's this notion inside it that there's um, um, a, a, a theme around life and the time we have, um, finding a way to survive, to live fully, overcome challenges, get the best out of ourselves. And these things are 100% consonant with the some of the, the lyrical work in images and words. Um, and then I started thinking of, after listening to um, a view from the top of the world uh, a couple of times the past few days, I, I, I realized like the through line is not just the thematics. I care about that stuff because I, I write books, but it's the, the consistency in the play. Like you guys are known for that. You're all really um, stunningly good players, but the songwriting has remained a, uh, um, a constant we talked about it that at the beginning like you guys yeah. care about that um the so there was a maturity even back then you've continued to build on that um and you you seem like it, it seems like you're you are willing or you naturally treat this music with um lyrical ideas that just have this like added resonance they're they're usually not puff pieces yeah um so my takeaway from this john was that it for for fans that heard Pull Me Under 30 years ago. And uh, I, by the way, I heard it just the other day on Sirius Radio. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, it was on um, Hair Nation of all places. <laughs> oh, that's great. Awesome. <laughs> I thought, you know, there's there's people who are big fans in that time. Sure. Uh, anybody who maybe hasn't stayed current with the band, this is my encouragement to them is that, that you guys are making music as good, if not better, than you were 30 years ago. I don't want to throw shade at Images. Images, sure. foundational record. But there's, it's not like um, 
you guys are still, I keep saying firing on all pistons, like all of the musicianship is still at this level. There's still the hunger to, to write the best thing you can write. Right. Um, anyway, I, I think it's a remarkable thing to be able to say that after, uh, especially at the altitude of, with which you guys are making music because you're known as that kind of band. And I, I wonder, um, like, do you, does it feel that way to you? Or is this just, is this just sort of a fan lens I'm looking through? Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. I, I mean it, Peter. I really appreciate you saying something that powerful because, you know, it, isn't that uh, the best thing that any musician or creative person can hear that what they're doing currently um, is resonating just as much or more as something they did 30 years ago with yeah. somebody. So I really appreciate that. That that makes me feel very happy. Uh, you're also very perceptive as a great lyricist and novelist writer, and you pick up on things very precisely, uh, as you did with the images and words thread, whether we meant it or not. Um, and that continuing along in a view from the top of the world with people's experiences, overcoming adversity, uh you know having a po positive outlook and how we how we deal with those things and treat those situations uh and overcome those situations um you're right that that's you're totally totally on the money with all that and uh again you know we're we like i said in the beginning we love doing what we do you know we're very we we're very thankful that we're able to have a career in music and get to play our instruments and you know being a studio or on stage and having people appreciate what we do and sharing that with people, we never take that for granted. Um, and so the combination about the combination of loving what you do and, you know, having the opportunity to do it over and over again is also so exciting because every time you go in to do another record, it's like you roll up your sleeves. All right, what are we going to do now? You know, this is so yeah. much fun. Um, and until that fun stops, you know, we're still going to, we're going to approach it every, every session, every show with that same kind of spirit of enthusiasm and, and wonder makes it, you know, music is such a special thing in all of our lives. So, well, because you guys were willing to sort of follow your hearts in terms of the kind yeah. of music you wanted to make, yeah. you, carved, you carved your own niche. Right. So you've been sort of impervious to a lot of the, the trends and yeah. because you've stayed um committed as you've just described um you've kept those fans and you've earned new fans um the the i, I encourage everybody to, to to like for me i know i go back when i do these sorts of things or or out of nostalgia when there's an anniversary right but honestly when you guys put out a new record it goes in my cd because i still buy cds yeah um goes in my cd player and it stays in my cd player probably till the next dream theater record comes nice out. nice um, and so i'll go back but I listen to the current stuff. Um, and as I've just done that again with, in, with this sort of book, these bookends, um, it was remarkable to me to sort of be able to see um, the quality of play and composition. Um, the fact that you won, you know, um, industry acknowledgements then, you're winning them now. Yeah. Um, it, all of that stuff, it's just this, this, this beautiful legacy that you've created for yourself. And I, I wanted to, I know you've done some other conversations probably around the anniversary, but what was important to me is to try and really um, say it in a way that it's not, it, um, it's not, Hey, they used to be great. Right. Right. <laughs> well, no, I, I appreciate that. I love, I love your take on it and your whole perspective today. And, you know, we, we're very, very fortunate. And one of the things I love about uh, the people that listen to our music and fans of our music is that they, they anticipate the new music that we, we come out with. Yeah. and look forward to that just as much as they're nostalgic about the old music. And, you know, as a fan of any band, you might have a certain song or record that you prefer more, sure. or you love this, or you like this certain period. But man, when we go and we play live and we're playing everything from a brand new song back to back with one of the first things we ever wrote and we get the same kind of reaction, um, that says so much, you know, it, that uh, we love that. It's not like people are sitting there bored. We're playing a new song and then cheering. We're playing an old, it's like the same amount of, uh, enthusiasm and, and love from the audience comes back to us, whether we're playing the count of Tuscany or a view from the top of the world or pull me under. So yeah. I love that. I, I really love that. I think it's, it's rare 
for bands to have that that have had a long career and so again we we value that so much so yeah it was exactly the experience i had when you guys were in seattle on tour nice awesome man well um are you before i let you go are you doing anything interesting around the anniversary with the guys or we'll just be like a group text and say we're still here (laughs) yeah yeah probably just a group text we're all all in different places right now uh and uh so no plans are getting together but yeah we'll, we'll we'll probably have a toast when we are back together we're gonna our next show is actually in indonesia in oh, uh, saw that. Yeah. in august yeah so that'll be the next time we're all together so uh, but yeah probably just group text hey <laughs> well um my friend it was a it was a life-changing record for me um put me on a, a musical path and i've been a fan nice since um and the new stuff is every bit is good every bit is good that's not me just throwing a um a, you know a, a bon mot your way that yeah um i love i love the new stuff as much thank you so folks who who uh, see this you're probably dream theater fans but if you haven't stayed current with with these guys check out their current records um i i have every confidence you're going to love them and john awesome. i hope you have a uh you, oh i have i have one more question was just 4th of July. Did you grill? I didn't grill. No, I did not grill. We were in the city and oh, we, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we enjoyed the fireworks in Manhattan and, uh, I, I did thought about grill. you. Sorry. <laughs> I thought about you because you told me you got the yes. big grill. I thought, ah, that oh, guy's man. cooking up some meat today. You know what? I, I, sorry to disappoint you, but <laughs> I promise I'll grill tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, right, hey, cool. thanks so much for the time. Um, um, Congratulations on the Grammy, but on a Thanks. career that um, was well begun and, and still going strong. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it. All right. Take good care. All right. Talk to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.